Get the power to do more with storable insurance. More offering. More enrollment. More protection for you and your customers. Storable helps operators do more with the most powerful technology in self-storage. Learn more at storable.com slash do more. So my name is Matt Beal, and I'm a product marketing manager here at Storable, and I'm going to be your host for the four operator imperatives webinar series. And before we got into today's discussion, I want to give you guys a quick little bit of context, kind of an overview of where we've come from and where we're going. So one is two weeks ago, we opened our last chapter of this four operator imperatives webinar series. And we had a conversation on um, amplifying your operating revenue. And so we discussed how you can utilize a combination of revenue management tools and non-rental revenue streams uh, to make up for some offset and, and tenant demand and, and NOI that we've been seeing in the industry. And so if you missed that presentation and you want to check it out, you can head to blog.storable.com and you can actually see all of our past webinars as well. But today we're excited to be hosting two great operators who we'll be introducing momentarily uh, for a roundtable discussion on that same topic. And so they're going to be discussing kind of some of their most effective strategies, some important lesson learned, uh, lessons learned, and then also just where they're currently focused in this space. And then as we've mentioned before, uh, today is the last webinar of this series. And so that does not mean that we're done, uh, but it does, uh, in, in fact, kind of what we are spending the next couple of months doing uh, is we're going to go on a bit of a hiatus during the holidays. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be designing some new exciting content um, to help you enhance your operations in 2021 and beyond and kind of reimagine what this looks like for you guys. So be on the lookout for some more details on this a little bit later this year. But without further ado, I want to get into today's roundtable discussion. So today's panel is going to be moderated by Chuck Gordon, the CEO of Storable. So Chuck, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Uh, hello, everyone. Glad to see you all again today for uh, the last webinar of this series. Excited to have Sue Havland, who's the owner of Havland Storage Services, here with us today, and Randy Weissman, the VP of Strategy at SROA. Uh, we're going to have a, a great discussion. Thank you both for being here. So before we get into kind of the specific topics, just want to check in generally. I mean, how, how do you feel things are going out there in the market? You know, now that we're well into Q4 in terms of rental volumes and uh, just generally speaking, you know, operating in this environment. Sue, why don't we start with you? Um, well, I was happy to see Q4 come because as we know, earlier this year, we all kind of hit a wall. And um, for most of my clients and stores that we operate, we've seen great rental numbers. Um, we haven't had that high of delinquencies, actually. A couple markets obviously are little harder than others but um we're back to being able to do rent increases and um starting to feel normal and starting to feel like we're going to be able to make up where we stayed a little flat earlier this year excellent yeah that's seems pretty consistent with what i've been hearing out in the market how about you randy uh, uh similar um experience I, I think that the biggest difference this year is that we missed our peak we missed know that the early part of that moving season and the college season hit a little earlier but it wasn't as big as it normally uh, would have been and it, it is more back to normal but you know, obviously there's concern about a second wave and, and additional lockdowns and additional uh, restrictions being put in that could stop revenue management and options and, and things that we put a hold on earlier you know back right. in March. We, we right. also have a couple couple stores that like when you mentioned Brandy the college you know growth that we get during the summertime normally October September October is when we have those high vacancies from them and we didn't get them so now it's kind of the when will we get them at what point right. are some of these kids actually going to come try to get their stuff if they aren't going back to school or you know allowed on campus and so it's not knowing you know how when we always knew when we'd get those 30, 40 vacancies, and now we don't know when we might get those. So. Right, and, yeah. and there's schools right now that are saying after Thanksgiving, they're going virtual again. So is that gonna create, you know, that middle semester, I guess, slight push early, or is that gonna lead to the vacates where people are gonna decide, hey, I'm not gonna go back to school. So it, it's gonna be interesting. That is gonna be interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, at least even if with cases rising again and the, the potential looming increased lockdown situation, 
at least we know that self-storage will stay open, right? We, we learned that last time. It's just a matter of, are they gonna put restrictions on what we can do or not? Right. Um, hopefully they don't. So, uh, all right, moving along to the kind of uh, topic of this webinar specifically, you know, one of the premises of this conversation is just around the rising cost of tenant acquisition in general uh, throughout 2019 and 2020, um, not necessarily COVID related, but certainly seen throughout. Is that something, you know, that's something we've heard from a lot of customers. Have you guys seen that as well? Uh, Randy, why don't we start with you on this one? Uh, you know, you, you do have additional cost of, of acquiring a tenant, but you know, I think right now in, in this time, it's, it's time to really focus on your fundamentals. So if you were, um, let's say you're going to spend $5,000 on marketing to generate 100 leads. And out of those 100 leads, you're going to get 50 rentals. You're going to spend $100 per customer for your acquisition costs. If you work on those other 50 people that you didn't get, let's say you get up to 60 rentals. So you got the same $5,000 you spent. You got the same uh, lead base that you had before, but you but you rent now 60 of those customers, you're down to what, $83, $84 as an acquisition cost. And if you can get to 65, you're running down to 75 or $76. So one way to manage that cost, because you, you're gonna spend what you spend, is to do a better job of renting to the people who become leads. And so our focus is really is, is to focus on the fundamentals, to do a better job of, of closing or get a better moving rate of the people that, that are coming to us. Right. So instead of worrying about how to tr try to go spend more money necessarily, focus on uh, doing more with what you already have. Correct. And Randy, that's such a great point because with so much of the stuff I've been doing remotely lately is just even logging in to you know, look at people's settings and kind of help do checkups for them on how the staff are doing as they transition more remotely. And one of the biggest things I see is how long it's taking for those leads to be worked. And so when, if you don't work those leads right away as they're coming in, you know, Sue or Randy are gonna, you know, if we compete with you. And so what's your setup, what do you have? If you're that manager or what do you have for your staff to make sure that, you know, do people know the expectation for following up on leads? Do you have a, you know, a written, you know, instruction for them of how soon you want it done, how often you want it done, in what ways you want it done? So calls, emails, texting, what? Right. And, and, and you really, sure? oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, it's really in what you say. So, you know, my, my, favorite thing to not hear is, hey, this is Randy. I'm calling about uh, the storage unit. Do you still want it? You got to give the customer a reason to call you back or a reason to go ahead and complete an online rental. You got to give them a reason to do that. Whether it's, hey, you know, you're reserved to 10 by 10. Uh, and I know that that may work for you, but I got 25 different sizes and I may be able to find something more within your budget. Give them a reason to call you back. Yep. Sales tactics to be easier to do business with so um one of the key things too when we're talking about the fundamentals um and i'm sure randy agrees i think sometimes when we get going and we're in normal times you know you don't always look at things as closely as you would now that we're looking at everything with the pandemic and you know there's a lot of operators that do pay attention but there's a lot when, when things are good they just keep it going so one of the things I also noticed with the pandemic is, you know, we're so focused on our customer experience as well, but how is our employees experience? Are we making sure we're checking on them as well to make sure they have everything they need or what their stress levels are? Because if they're stressed and they're fearful or how they're feeling is gonna affect completely how easy we are to do business. If we've thrown a bunch of new ways to do business at them, and so let's not forget to, you know, do employee checks as well and how, you know, good we are as employers to do the work for. That's a key point. Sure. Um, and then what, what do you guys, so a lot of people say, you know, you got to respond to or follow up with leads within 10 minutes. Do you guys subscribe to that? And what tools are you using to actually 
make sure that that's happening. Um, Sue, why don't we start with you on that one? Um, yeah, absolutely. That's I try to stick with the 10 minute. Um, you know, the staff are supposed to keep their screens popped up. So if any of their notifications come in through the website, the call center, that they see that right away. Um, depending how many staff I may have on a day, given day at a property, certain ones that may be their, what they're focused on and they're watching that closer while well, people are focused on you know, collection calls or something else. But we try to stick to that because like I said, if we wait too long, if, if anybody's like me, if you're online and you're looking for something and you generate a lead, you don't want to be called back four hours later because you have that yeah. need right then and you're working on it. So not to miss that window. And so we have a combination of calling, emailing, texting, you know, just making sure that we can try to get a hold of them, you know, and like Brandy said, making sure we don't contact them, leaving a good message to entice them to want to call us back. Right. And, and keep that discussion going. So. Got it. Brandy? Uh, it's similar. I mean, you know, if somebody goes to the website or calls our uh, call center, they get an immediate email and and or text message. Uh, but that does not take the place of a manager calling them back. And, you know, there has to be some type of personal uh, interaction at some point in time to anybody who's undecided. So it's a 10 minute rule and five calls in the first three days. Wow. Yeah. Hopefully okay. Well, I think so. What's that? Hopefully, it doesn't take that many. Right. Right. Exactly. If you can get hold of them, so I think that that's good. And that, that those are best practices where if you really follow that stuff, you know, you're going to have an edge in your competition. Um. All right. So can just I in just terms throw of throw one other thing in, Chuck. Just making sure your software defaults are set for the staff as well to alert them with the timing and the follow up you want. So. It's not set to follow up two days later if you want them immediate. And then again, it all gets into that training. But, you know, depending what your settings can be, you can really help your staff be successful at it by having those defaults set appropriate. Right. So you mean like within SiteLink? <laughs> Had to throw it in there. Of course. Um, okay. So how about on um, just kind of other things you guys are doing to drive, um, you know, additional revenue uh, during these times? I mean, are you working hard on your insurance programs or, uh, or or other things that might drive some ancillary revenue? Randy? So, you know, for us, insurance is a given. Um, you know, it's required in our rental agreement. And uh, obviously you can opt out. Uh, you can't make anybody take the coverage, but it's just part of the culture that, hey, if you're in a storage unit, you have to cover your goods while they're in storage. And right. uh, I, I think for those who are not uh, selling tenant insurance or property protection, they, they are missing an opportunity for a revenue stream that's ongoing over an extended, you know, the, the complete life uh, cycle of the customer. And uh, I think it's very important that, that they participate in that. Right, and it's it's not really just about the extra revenue you can drive too, but it's about the protection you're actually providing to that tenant just in case something does happen. Yeah, and if you've ever been in a facility where you've had a fire or a tornado or something, and, and the people that have coverage are you know a phone call away from getting a settlement, versus the people that that had no coverage whatsoever, uh, there's a huge difference, and there's a huge difference in how they treat your staff and and, and what your your employees go through. And, and those who don't believe in tenant protection or insurance, once they are involved in a situation where something does happen, where where it is, you know, required at the property, they become your best salesman from there on, right and forward, because they they now know the value of it. Yep. And, and there's been an uptick in break-ins in certain markets as well. I mean, more than we've had. You know, we've always had break-ins in storage, obviously, but. You know, I've got one store in particular. I have a really bold guy who, yay, they caught him yesterday. All guns out. I got all kinds of pictures with the police with all their guns drawn. The manager saw him on the camera because he would drive in every day and try to act like he was a customer and hit a unit. And by the time the police would get there, he'd be gone. So finally yesterday they caught him. But wow. he's, he's tied to, in that market, hitting six different operators. And wow. one of them he had hit 
over 40, 80, 40 doors on one and 80 doors on another one. It, yeah, so they finally caught him. But how nice for my manager to, when he calls these people, to tell them, number one, we caught him, but you have our protection plan. And so, you you know, here's, you need to do your police report. And so on top of, you know, us looking like we're doing more and what we can do for our customers, you know, they, it's an easier day for the manager when, you know, that protection is in place. And, right. you know, the upside, like Randy says, is when you, don't have anything happening. It's just it's all that extra revenue you're leaving sitting out there. I don't understand why people still leave that sitting out there. Yeah. I think a lot of people have this fear that, you know, if they start charging, then, you know, they, they don't have an advantage compared to the others that do. But at the end of the day, you're really disadvantaging yourself because if something ever happens, you know, you're going to get a ton of bad reviews. You're going to have a lot of angry customers and that's going to be much, much worse than uh, helping that customer overcome an extra 10 bucks a month. Well, that's that same mindset for people who have owned their stores for years and brag and are proud that they don't do rent increases. Right. You know, because everybody will move out and we all know that doesn't really happen. And, yep. you know, if you're, if you're 98% occupied, it's okay if a couple of people move out and you move somebody in at a higher rate. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, it's amazing how many people don't do that still especially given all the tools that are out there to kind of help revenue manage and, and ultimately increase the value of your property. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Are there other things you guys are doing maybe on the cost side that are kind of helping uh, boost results a little bit these days? Sue, why don't we start with you on that one? Sure. And I think Randy and I both done this um, in some locations, you know, you pick another day that's not as busy. And now that, especially if you're running everything as touchless as you can, we, you close the store. So whether that, if you were open on Sundays and you close on Sundays or you pick a day in the middle of the week um, and, you know, try to help that way with some of the expenses or modify the hours um, that you have to have people on property. Because depending on um, how you operate, some people have somebody there from the time the gate opens to the time the gate leaves maybe you've modified gate hours to cut payroll back a little bit or you close one of the days. And I've also, at um, one of my clients, we've gone instead of having full-time floaters or reliefs at each store, we're sharing a couple floaters to have a couple less employees. Got it. How big of an impact has that had for you, Sue? Like dollars and cents wise? Um, well, probably not as big as we'd like, but um, it's it's a start, you know. And, and you know, as an industry, we always we always kind of go to the payroll first to to look for where we can share um, expenses amongst other sites if we have them close together or entirely just for one site. So, um, got it. Okay, makes sense, Randy. Yeah, I know. I totally agree. And you know, one of the things that has happened is that walk-in traffic has gone down compared to what it was prior to COVID. Uh, yep. So the need to sit and wait on customers where you'd have six or eight people standing in line on a Saturday, you know, that, that doesn't happen anymore. A lot of that business has shifted to, to touchless online rentals. Uh, so we, we've looked at uh, um, managing our hours as well because it's the biggest expense item that, that you can impact. I can't change property taxes. I can't change insurance. You know, maintenance is what it is, but I can manage my con my controllable expenses. And, and and one of those is the payroll line. So you know, we close some stores on Wednesday, which typically is uh, one of the slowest days of the week. We've looked at Sunday hours and, and in the smaller stores, uh, and the ones that don't need it, we're not open on Sunday. Yet we're still able to conduct business because people can still pay online. Our call center is open to take calls and to help customers, and they can right. rent online and they can rent through our call center. So it it hasn't affected business, but it's allowed us to manage you know our operating expenses at the same time. One of my other clients that has nine locations pretty close together closed the offices to all of them, but his biggest store, and so now all the employees have flex time where they all work out of the one store and answer all the calls for all the stores and do all the, you know, follow up and things out of one store versus having staff at all. 
So that's probably a huge savings. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay. So it looks like we've got a couple questions that have come in, Matt. You want to read those off for us? Yeah, gladly. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So the first question was, um, uh, the, the concept of call centers has come up quite a bit today, and then Randy kind of tying it to something you brought on earlier in the call, which is this idea of kind of returning to the fundamentals and focusing on how you can maximize your lead conversion rate. Um, one of the questions that came in was kind of talking about the advantages and disadvantages of running, you know, internal operations versus a third-party call center and whether or not, you know, it's realistic to kind of expect the same sales pipeline close rate as if you had done it internally. So just if you, if you guys don't mind kind of discussing your experience there and kind of, some of the pros and cons of both approaches. Uh, uh, I've always looked at sales as a two-step process, and I've always looked at a call center and what their job is is to get you the name phone number get you the, the lead i've looked at the store manager as the person that closes that lead. even if it is a hard reservation that's coming out of your call center be it third party or or your own internal call center there still has to be a manager touch point hey my name's randy i'm the manager of the property here's how you get into the gate your your unit is you know three doors down on the second aisle to the right and, and going through those types of things with the customer so it's always, in my mind, been a two-step process. But uh, I don't think that a manager, uh, with all they have to do uh, during the course of the day, can give sales the um, attention that it needs. If somebody's standing in front of you trying to make a payment and the phone rings, what do you do? You know, do you answer the phone and, and take care of that customer while, they, while the person standing in front of you is tapping their finger on the counter trying to write you a check? Or do you, you know, what do you do? And it's always put that manager in a tough situation where, where they end up not doing the best job they can because we don't put them in a position where, where they can do the best job. So that's where I think a call center comes in. That makes sense. I agree. I, agree. I think a call center is a great tool for our managers and to use it as a tool for our managers to support them. Like you said, when they're busy or if they're out showing a unit, and are they supposed to, you know, always carry the phone outside and try to answer in the middle of a sales presentation for prospective new customers versus, you know, having somebody answer and then being able to get right back to them and give them their full attention. So, I, I, I in the past too, I've had where when I have newer people and I'll have the call center answer all the calls until they're ready and then that gives them all those calls to call back as practice on the leads as well. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Matt, was there one more question as well? Yeah, we actually have two more. We have a little bit of time if you guys are okay with that. Um, right. One is kind of adjacent to today's conversation, but um, uh, one of the operators is talking about how they are 94% full um, occupancy wise, but they only have about half of their clients on auto pay. And so they're curious if you guys have any tips on just kind of how to address uh, going about increasing that percentage. That's a good one. Sue, you want to take uh, that one? I, I, can go, I can go. Yeah, that's one of the things that I constantly work on with my team to try to always increase those percentages because uh, that makes their lives a lot easier. And um, so we'll have comments about joining auto pay on our receipts, our invoices posted in the office, on our kiosk message, on our keypad message, and then we will do um, blasts out to the customers that are on it a few times a year, trying to incentivize them whether you know you find what works for if you sign up for auto pay this month, get $25 off, or you know, just whatever you find that might work or what you're willing to give to get that person on because. You know, all our stats show that they stay longer, they're less receptive to rent increases, and that. So if you, you know, you're gonna give 10 or $25 to get them on, you know, and you know, every, you've probably heard webinar after webinar about it's the no late fee guarantee. You know, I've seen banners with that, ask me about our no late fee guarantee. You know, what, what little you know, tagline will work for you, but, um, and then listen to your, staff sales presentations when they, you know, give information out to new prospective customers when they're doing a lease presentation. Is that part of their presentation? Are they talking about auto pay and, and asking people to go on it? The, Keep the that auto pay prompt on site link so it always, right. they have to ask answer that every time. 
There the you the go. only thing I would add to that is that uh, when somebody wants a late fee waived, I tie it to an auto pay. I'll be happy to waive your late fee, but you got to sign up for auto pay. That's yeah, I've, I've even used, we'll waive our admin fee if you sign up for auto pay. If they say no at first, and a lot of times they'll sign up. They say like 20 or 25 bucks. Do you guys incentivize your managers too? Uh, or not, enrollment? No, 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 no. I have a total, I have a total revenue base type of bonus plan. So Got you know, it. as the revenue grows, everybody wins. Yep, fair enough. I have heard of some people doing that too, just as an additional idea for whoever asked that question. Well, actually, uh, to be fair, I have run that as a contest before. I'll do contests yeah. for um, CPP, um, that, you know, to get more people, existing customers on CPP, that might be a contest for a month or it will be auto pays. Or, so I have done that. Got and, it. And that one, but not as an ongoing. Got it. Okay. And Matt, was there uh, one more question? Yep, I believe we got time for one more. So, um, Randy, this one's calling back to something you mentioned as well, which was uh, this idea that, you know, you've created a culture where selling insurance is just the norm, right? It is just kind of part of their operating rhythm. And so um, if, if you don't mind just kind of unpacking maybe even just a couple of recommendations on how someone can kind of get started down there. I think a lot of people struggle with that becoming a part of their manager's normal day. Well, you know, when somebody puts stuff that that is important enough for them to, to pay money to us to store it, uh, they should in some way, shape or form have coverage on that, on those goods. And, and I know a lot of folks will come in and they'll say, hey, you know, I have a, a homeowner's policy that'll cover it. Well, the one thing that happens with every homeowner's policy is each one of them carries a deductible. Typically it's 10% of the value of your house. So if you have a $100,000 house, it's a you know $1,000 deductible, $200,000 house, it could be a $2,000 deductible. Well, you could layer in your tenant property protection and your tenant insurance on top of that. And then, you know, you tell your tenant, hey, great, you know, I understand that, that you have protection and that'll cover you over the $2,000 standard that I've given you, but I'm covering your deductible. No questions asked, you know, just, just, you know, it's important that you, you protect your goods. Yeah. Hey, if anybody is ever not sure if they want to do that program, they can talk to me or one of my managers right. dealt with a fire yeah. <laughs> and how great it was and how much it helps to have that for the customers who walk in and see a black pile of char that used to be their stuff. Yep. And and I would also just offer out there that, um, you know, one of the big things our store smart insurance team does here at Storable is help create that culture of making insurance a priority uh, when we do work with our clients. So I think it's, you know, it's, you have to think it through, you got to think through how you're going to roll it out, but it's definitely something that can be done. And, and a place to start is in your rental agreement, that, that if you require um, coverage in your rental agreement, that that gives you a, a contractual tool uh, to sell. Right. It's not like a few years ago where you were the only one in your market trying to do it. And, you know, the managers would say, oh, but nobody else does it. I mean, if you took a harder look now, I'd say there's probably more of the majority are not doing it, you know, maybe in a few markets. But if you're in a market where you're competing with any kind of sophisticated operators, they're they're going to have it in one yep. way, way, shape or form. So, you know, again, great revenue thing, great service for your customers you know if you roll it out right to your staff and train them and like you said most of our vendors they have training they have templates they help you you know get literature and then you know yeah roll it roll it out the right way and roll it out the right way to your existing customers too so they don't feel smacked in the head with it versus you've been letting them know it's coming yeah, here it is. Yep. All right, guys. Well, we are at time. Sue, Randy, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Your insight is invaluable. Uh, really appreciate your time today. And Matt, we will hand it back over to you. Thank you, Chuck. Very good. So before we let everybody go real quick, just another reminder um, that this does mark the conclusion of our four Operator Imperatives webinar series. And so, uh, Randy, Sue, we really appreciate you guys joining us for the conclusion. Like Chuck mentioned, I think that was a great conversation. So 
Um, the Storable team is going to be taking a brief hiatus for these webinars in particular over the holidays so that we can kind of go back to the drawing board and some, design some new exciting content for you guys. So we're going to rethink our approach on how we can help you guys continue to enhance your operations in 2021 and beyond. But that does conclude today's discussion. So if you guys do have any questions that come up throughout the week, um, or frankly, in the next couple of months before we're back, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at webinars at storable.com. Uh, but to all of you guys out there, just stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you for attending and have a great day. Get the power to do more with storable software, more automating, more control, more revenue, more time back in your day. Storable helps operators do more with the most powerful technology in self-storage. Learn more at storable.com slash do more.